Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. Today's date is September 21st, 2021. Happy Equinox. And today we're going to look at two articles that got me thinking about the same basic subject. That subject being the basic impossibility of working within the Democratic Party as a socialist. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe and consider supporting us on Patreon. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So, if you've been listening to this channel for any length of time, you know that we don't support the strategy of trying to work within the Democratic Party as a socialist. Basically, our contention is that it's the fundamental task of the U.S. left to break completely with the Democratic Party and with all capitalist parties. That would be the Republican Party, Libertarian Party, Constitution Party for the weirdos. Um, but yeah, any of these parties, it's not going to work. The only semi-mainstream party that I support working within at all is the Green Party. And, you know, for example, I think that Howie Hawkins did some good work to bring the Green Party left, bring in some elements of real socialism. There, of course, though, is about half the Green Party, which is sort of hippie capitalists and stuff that I really wouldn't want to touch with a 10-foot pole. That said, I think that the Green Party follows some of the basic rules of the Bernie campaign, you know, no corporate money, that kind of thing. And, you know, as far as building some kind of organization to do local regional activism, maybe run some candidates in local races, I think you could do the Green Party. I do. But beyond that, you know, DSA endorses a lot of Democrats. They also do some good local activism. But I just absolutely cannot get behind the Democratic Party thing. It's been tried for decades. It doesn't work. Uh, Bernie Sanders, I thought, you know, maybe as this outsider, he was not a Democrat. And, you know, maybe could storm the gates, you know, crash the party. But here, there you had a guy filling stadiums, you know, very popular, as basically there's been this cry building for decades of people who want a change, don't want neoliberalism, you know, they at least want the Democratic Party to rebuild its liberal wing, which has been shredded. Of course, you know, here on this channel, we're Marxists, we're aiming a little bit higher than that, or a lot. Um, but yeah, even Bernie Sanders, popular guy, could have taken that momentum, channeled it into the Green Party or a new left party, and just didn't. And, you know, maybe it's better that he didn't if, I mean, if this is his basic impetus is to feed people into the Democratic Party, what he might have done was, you know, to set up a sham party that would have appeared to have been independent, but really would have been sort of an auxiliary support org for the Democratic Party as kind of, you know, our revolution or even DSA to some extent is. You need this break completely, you know, just renounce the Democratic Party and declare them an enemy. It's the only thing that's really going to work because they've been just picking off our ranks decade after decade. You get people who are like, well, we won't win unless we're... Okay, winning as a Democrat still means you lose because the party is owned by the 1%. And you have one of two possible outcomes trying to work within that party. You get either A, one thing done, and then they completely destroy your life. Or B, you just get assimilated and you just do what they want. And then you wonder what happened to the things that you used to believe in. So those are the two possibilities. We reject them both. And we reject the Democratic Party, which creates them. So... Anyway, I mentioned mainstream parties. There are, of course, Marxist parties. There's PSL, for example. There's other organizations like the Socialist Rifle Organization. Check out what's going on in your area. There's probably also unaffiliated, you know, non-national groups, a local mutual aid network, solidarity network, something. Get involved. You know, I do think that people should always try to join an org, get involved in a couple of projects in real life. It's going to help to sharpen your class consciousness. And it's also going to do some good for the place where you're living at. Okay, so let's get into these articles, which I mentioned about five minutes ago. All right, so the first article is from the Washington Post last week, and it's titled The Non-Trump GOP Erodes a Little Further. It's by Philip Bump. 
So they start out by talking about Anthony Gonzalez, who was a House Republican who voted to impeach Trump after 1-6. And then he announced recently that he would not be seeking re-election to spend more time with his family, blah, blah, blah. But Trump basically, you know, bashed him on the way out, saying, you know, this guy wasn't popular. And then after he went against me, he became even less popular, etc., so the article goes into some polling data about how important is Trump within the Republican Party. I'm putting those graphics on the screen. So you have three bars there. The lightest one at the top of each of these is GOP members plus GOP leaning independents. So and then Republicans is the middle line and then conservatives more of the, you know, hard right within the Republican Party is the darkest red line on the bottom. It's so funny, you know, of course, this is the United States where up is down, black is white, left is right. You know, normally red is the color of socialists. They use it for the fascist party. Welcome to the U.S. Anyway, so as you can see, starting at the upper left, a majority of all groups, GOP plus independents, GOP and conservatives, think that Trump should be the leader of the Republican Party. So about two-thirds do think that. Trump has not been disgraced in their eyes, clearly. Um, and then still a majority, a slimmer majority, but a majority in all cases, think that the best chance for the Republican Party in 2024 is with Trump as the presidential nominee. And the way that Biden is running things, that we're going to get to that in the second article, they do have a chance. I mean, we're going to go into the midterms next year. Historically, in the midterms, the opposing party has gains. So we're probably going to see more MAGA people in the Congress then. It's, and, you know, and then you get to watch the Democrats flail and whine and not really do anything about it. Anyway, moving on to the next section, these bottom six graphics have to do with what is important in terms of being a Republican, so sort of defining principles of being a Republican. Having conservative values, almost unanimous, all three groups agree on that. Opposing democratic policies, three out of four agree on that. Supporting the congressional Republicans, about eight or nine out of 10 agree on that. Less power for federal government, again, eight or nine out of 10 agree on that. So just as a side note, when people say that socialists can reach out to Republicans and things like that, which just always makes me laugh, it's kind of absurd. Think about what you're saying. These people believe that the problem is that the federal government's too big. It's one of the things that they're most united about. So the idea that they would be, I mean, you're assuming trying to have this conversation that you can explain to them the difference between the uh, capitalist government and the socialist government that we would want to replace it with. I mean, good luck. I, I definitely think at this stage of the game, this stage of organizing, that would not be the target group. Let's put it that way. Anyway, coming back to this, supporting Donald Trump, again, it's a little more split, independence, less likely to agree with that, but still a majority, six out of 10. And then for Republicans, seven out of 10. Supporting Donald Trump is like a defining issue of being a Republican. Also believing Trump won in 2020, about the same numbers down two percentage points. So this is what's going on in the Republican brain, more or less. But quoting from the article a little bit lower down, it says, quote, there's been a lot of polling since January trying to gauge how solid is Trump's grip on the party. It's likely an existential question for the GOP, if not American democracy itself. So, okay, let's take those two points separately. Is having Trump as the central Republican figure an existential question for the GOP? I would say no, although they didn't elaborate on why they think that is. So he's popular. <laughs> he was president. Uh, he got beaten by Biden in the middle of a pandemic. You know, it's likely people just wanted a change. 
Will he be back in 2024? He's still popular. And Biden is basically George W. Bush. I mean, Biden is running the pandemic response so badly, telling people to take their masks off, um, cutting off the unemployment. I mean, there's just really no plan at this point. Um, Biden is not really doing anything to cement his position in the government or, you know, really do anything for the Democrats. The Democrats so far have fallen through on every promise that they made, whether it was $15 minimum wage or really anything. I mean, Biden, for example, we know that he was not in favor of Medicare for all, but he was running on a public option thing, uh, at least in writing. He put it on his website that he was for a public option. I mean, he never said that out loud, so uh, obviously I didn't believe that he was going to fight for that. But technically, that was his platform. I mean, of course, we haven't heard a word about it. We're in a pandemic. They're just pumping cash into the economy. That's not going to hold forever. Um, I mean, there is the real likelihood of a severe crash in the not-too-distant future, like in the next couple of years. Um, I mean, I'm not looking forward to that, but it's just reality is what it is. You've got, for example, air travel was down by almost two thirds recently. People just aren't going out and doing all of the same things that they were. And rightly so. It's not safe. You know, uh, I like going to concerts, for example. But the idea that I'm going to go into an enclosed space with, you know, recycled air with a bunch of people who aren't wearing masks. No, I'm just not going to do it. You know, for me, even going to outdoor events where people aren't wearing masks and there's a crowd of people, it's like, I don't really want to do it because it's just not safe. Unless there's just a strong wind the entire day. I mean, uh, you're going to be breathing in other people's air. And, you know, with Delta, is that a risk you want to take? Anyway, not to get too sidetracked on that, but Biden is fucking up badly. I mean, we've gone past the first hundred days Bernie Sanders had this whole plan to hold Biden's feet to the fire. That has amounted in absolutely nothing. Um, so, yeah. Could Trump come back? Definitely. But so this article goes on. Well, and then so the whole thing about American democracy itself. Come on. I mean, first of all, from a socialist perspective, the U.S. is capitalist. It has a government which is entirely oriented around maintaining capitalism and managing capitalism, and it's basically a government predicated on the notion that rich people who own industry in a private capacity should rule the country. That's the basic gist of the U.S. ruling ideology. So is that democratic? Absolutely not, because while you have the cho you know certain amount of choice or illusion of choice in the political system, you know, as far as industry, workplaces, the shop floor, uh, people have basically no say. I mean, the average working person has no say in what gets produced, what are the raw materials used, where does the waste get handled, etc. I mean, major questions of industry and economy, which, you know, are outside the purview of politics per se and government, those are in the hands of private capitalists who are a tiny percentage of uh, the population. People say things like, oh, vote with your dollars. Well, some of us have way more dollars than others, so that's not democratic at all. Democracy is one person, one vote. Capitalism is one dollar, one vote, and dollars are not distributed equally at all. Like a tiny percentage of people control the vast majority of the stock market, for example. So, not a democracy. But even within the framing of, you know, capitalist bourgeois democracy, the U.S. government. Is Trump and the Republican Party, are they going to be the end of that? Well, I would actually rephrase that a little bit. Is Trump in particular going to be the end of that? Well, prior to Trump, so this is well before Trump, we had something called the Princeton Study on Democracy. You can look that up, just Princeton Study Democracy. Type it in. You can read the thing. What they found is that there is no statistical correlation between public opinion and public policy. However, there is a strong correlation between capitalist opinion and public policy, meaning the people 
who actually own the political parties and donate to their campaigns, their opinions are reflected in public policy. But the average voter, the average working person who votes, their opinions are totally disregarded. The entire working class base of both the Democrats and Republicans could be completely united on an issue. Like, for example, Medicare for all, 70% approval, 70% support from the average working person in the U.S. And like Bernie Sanders is basically the only longtime politician who really supports that. What does that tell you? Anyway, I think it speaks for itself. But so, you know, Trump, though, is this singular threat. They talked about George W. Bush in a somewhat similar way. And for my money, Bush and Cheney brought in way more changes to the way that the U.S. government works. And just in terms of precedent, uh, they established, I mean, this whole departure from any notion of 20th century, you know, liberal democracy. They took it in kind of a new direction that has, you know, been continued by Obama and Trump, et cetera, since then. So Trump's grip on the party, they're saying, is an existential question for American democracy. Do not believe this. Not that American democracy is in great shape. That's not uh, the issue here to the extent that capitalist, quote, democracy even is a democracy. But this framing that it's all about Trump is hysteria. There are people in the ruling class who don't like Trump. That's really what this is about. And they're trying to tell you, a working person, things to scare you so that you will share their dislike of Trump. Now, I don't like Trump because, you know, the birther stuff, the Tea Party, it's fascism. This is how you build fascism in a U.S. context. That plus the religious right. I mean, this has been going on since Reagan and Nixon and even before. But in its modern form, I mean, this is clearly the lineage. So Trump is the new inheritor of this. He's been playing to those people. I don't like any of that. Uh, but, you know, we're talking about the United States here. It's the home base of global imperialism. Like, do you expect to find good politics? Anything remotely socialistic or humanistic in the slightest degree, anything even remotely non-corporate is ruthlessly suppressed. That's what you get in the United States. You know, and like I said, anybody interested in breaking out of that, we have to build independent power and, uh, you know, Marxism provides a template for doing that. You have to actually fight your way out of this kind of oppression. You cannot just vote your way out of it. So anyway, the article goes on and it says, in fact, it's hard to imagine what a successful Republican opponent to Trump looks like. And then they start, you know, hypothesizing and theorizing about who could uh, defeat Trump. Well, anyway, the basic takeaway for me here is... And we saw this in the 2020 election. People like Bill Kristol, other people from, you know, more the Bush-Cheney wing of the Republican Party, which incidentally, you know, my take on what happened after Bush and Cheney, uh, which nobody really talks about that anymore. I mentioned this in my 9-11 videos last week. But basically, Bush and Cheney completely exhausted, burned out, extinguished the credibility and goodwill of their wing, you know, the sort of country club, non-populist wing of the Republican Party. It was done. And so the Tea Party popped up right at the end of the Bush-Cheney presidency. I mean, of course, it also was a, you know, a sort of astroturf response to the 2008 crash. But they pop up as the new face of the Republican Party. You know, McCain runs, is pretty badly crushed by Obama. People hated the Republican Party by the end of the 2000s because of Bush and Cheney. And, uh, be, you know, it's like, oh, hey, we're going to run uh, CIA covert torture sites around the world. For all of the evil shit that the U.S. has done, Bush and Cheney really dialed it up a notch and also were way more public about doing all of this. So that didn't come without a cost, you know. So the sort of McCain, Bush, Cheney wing of the Republicans is trashed. And something's going to fill that void. What filled it? This right populist, Tea Party, birther, MAGA side of the party, this proto-fascist to fascist 
side. That, that is what right populism is, essentially. And that has filled the vacuum. So now you've got a Republican Party, which, as those polls show, is really centered in that white nationalist MAGA wing. And you have people from the Bush, Cheney, McCain wing of the party who no longer feel comfortable in that party if for no other reason that they can't really run and win themselves. <laughs> so basically their governance and political strategies are no longer reflected in the Republican Party, which now has its center in another wing of the party. Well, where are they going? To the Democratic Party. And we saw this already with the you know, Bush, Cheney, McCain wing of the party uh, supporting, in some cases, Joe Biden. You know, you have the never Trump phenomenon, things like that. Where are these people going? They're going to the Democratic Party. So in as far as social Democrats and, you know, DSA type people uh, who are supporting the Democratic Party, I don't mean to throw under the bus, you know, Marxists and other actual radicals working within DSA who reject all the Democratic Party nonsense. I don't mean to uh, slam you. I know you're there. But for the DSA Rose Twitter types who, you know, here's how Bernie can still win, etc. cetera, um, you're not taking over this party. Uh, I've said before in previous videos on this general subject that you think you're going to pull the party left. They're thinking that they're going to pull you right. And they're correct. I mean, look at Joe Biden, for example. People are like, we're going to pull Biden left. How's that working out? Biden isn't even holding to the bullshit promises that he made you while he was running. So you think you're going to get not only the things he lied to you about that he was going to do, but you think you're going to get those and more? You're dreaming. Wake up and look at the screen. You've lost. I mean, you know, the, the game is technically not yet over, but forget it. You know, it's Biden 100, you three. Like, forget it. It's not going to work, okay? So you think you're going to pull this party left. Meanwhile, you've got powerful, influential ex-Republicans also working with the Biden Democrats, and they're just stronger than you are. You know, when you're trying to play in this game of bourgeois politics, it's their game. Anyway, so you've got that from that angle. Now, let's take a closer look at Biden and really what is he up to. So here's the second article. This is from the New York Times again last week. Biden announces defense deal with Australia in a bid to counter China it's by David E. Sanger and Zolan Kano Youngs. So from the article, quote, the Biden administration took a major step on Wednesday in challenging China's broad territorial claims. Ooh, China with their broad territorial claims. Won't someone do something about that? You almost want to just scream to the heavens after reading that phrasing. Announcing that the United States and Britain would help Australia to deploy nuclear-powered submarines, adding to the Western presence in the region. Now note, these are not submarines armed with nuclear weapons. They're just nuclear-powered basically means they can run for a very long period of time. So the U.S., along with the U.K. and Canada, are trying to turn Australia into an anti-China weapon and, you know, a front closer to China's region of the world. So, as it says, if the plan comes to fruition, Australia may begin conducting routine patrols that could move through areas of the South China Sea which Beijing claims as its exclusive zone and range as far north as Taiwan. <sighs> Don't do this. <laughs> um, you know, my understanding is China more or less owns Australia at this point, and the right-wingers are just freaking out about it. This is an ill-advised move. I don't care if it makes you think and feel like you're taking some power back, but it is... You've lost. I mean, China is on the rise. All of these former empires are on the way down. Capitalism in general is on the way down. It's propped up almost solely by the U.S. military budget, without which the world would be moving on to socialism already. Anyway, 
quote, the announcement made by President Biden, Prime Minister Boris Johnson of Britain, and Prime Minister Scott Morrison of Australia is a major step for Australia, which until recent years has been hesitant to push back directly at core Chinese interests. Well, where is that hesitancy coming from? I mean, it's moot. It's <laughs> how's Australia going to compete with China? Think about it. It's it's not possible. So just accept reality here. Um, but no, they don't want to accept reality. So as the article goes on, this is a quote from Biden. This is about investing in our greatest source of strength, our alliances, and updating them to better meet the threats of today and tomorrow, Mr. Biden said in the East Room, etc. It's about connecting America's existing allies and partners in new ways. Goes on to say the submarines would almost certainly carry conventional submarine launched cruise missiles. And Morrison says, quote, let me be clear. Australia is not seeking to acquire nuclear weapons or establish a civil nuclear capability. So it mentions that Australia is a signatory to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which bans it from acquiring or deploying nuclear weapons. But let's step back again. Biden talking about, you know, the allies are their greatest source of strength. Well, the threats of tomorrow... Is China actually a threat to the U.S.? Are they expressing belligerent intentions? Look at the U.S. right now. It's drowning in a sea of COVID that it can't be bothered to manage. Not only is it, you know, spreading like wildfire through the U.S. domestic population, but of course the U.S. is serving as a Petri dish for, you know, that virus to spread to the rest of the world to the extent that other countries are even allowing people from the U.S. in because of this situation. You have a failing economy, which had a major crash in 2008, a very unsteady recovery since then. They've just been pumping cash into it year after year. You can't buy a house anymore, basically. Prices have, like, quadrupled. You know, and of course, wages and salaries definitely haven't. In fact, working conditions are so bad in the U.S. that... We're undergoing something that the media is calling the great resignation or, you know, the labor shortage, quote unquote. I mean, and my take on that is you see people calling and have been for years calling for a general strike on social media. Like we need a general strike. We need a general strike. The problem with the U.S. is we don't really have strong left organizations which could really coordinate such a thing. But what we do have is social media networks of sometimes tens of thousands of followers, you know, for particular accounts, and then those accounts follow each other, et cetera, et cetera. So you do have decentralized networks there of semi-class conscious to class conscious workers who are in touch with each other. And people have been sharing grievances from all different parts of the country, all different industries for years now. It's low wages. It's you know, on-demand scheduling, where you have no idea what your schedule is going to be from week to week, you know, clopening, you're going to start, like, basically do second shift one day and first shift the following day, so you, like, barely even leave work overnight. It's no benefits. It's abusive management. It's all these things, and people have been talking about it for so long, albeit, you know, not so much through orgs, but in this, you know, decentralized social media network. I think people finally, you know, adding the pandemic, you know, fears of getting COVID or, you know, somebody's brother died of COVID or somebody's, you know, mother or so on. People have kind of reached a breaking point. And I think that you basically have, in effect, a, that general strike starting to manifest in ways that, you know, again, it's non-traditional, not really through an org but just from thousands of people talking to each other over social media for years now. Anyway, to me, this, you know, labor shortage, great recession, this is the general strike that people have been talking about for a long time. It's slow uh, and it's not, you know, doesn't have any particular leaders per se, but it is collectively, you know, all the, the conversations people have been having, I do think that they have been adding up to this. So 
you know, keep agitating, keep educating, and keep organizing. Because I do think we'll continue to see these kind of decentralized phenomena appearing uh, out of workers becoming more class conscious and having the courage to, you know, act on it. People are just fucking fed up. And there's a lot of opportunity in that for creating positive change. So get involved and stay involved in those in those networks and whatever organizations do pop up. It's I think it's worth it because it may not be, you know, as simple as an org calls a general strike, etc. But we do have, you know, a general strike type effect showing up and there is not a central strike fund, for example. But you see people setting up, you know, GoFundMe's and things like that, which work in a similar way. At some point, you know, this may coalesce and cohere into something more organized, which would be great if it can take us to the next step. But insofar as it's working, I do see something there in these, again, decentralized leftist networks. Um, and I think that throughout the 2030s, this is going to be something that socialists need to pay attention to and to work with and uh, encourage to grow in ways that, you know, probably will be helpful to the working class. Uh, again, joining the Democrats, not so much. You know, so like I was saying, the country is basically falling apart. Um, after the next 2008 type crash, I mean, we had a crash in 2020. They started just pumping money in and it's kind of stabilized, but prices are ridiculous right now. I don't know how long this will last. At the next 2008 type event, how much support for this system do you really think there's going to be? It's its own worst enemy. We've known this about capitalism for a long time. It makes a few people rich, but it's very unstable. And the longer that it exists, it creates deeper and deeper inequality, which eventually tear your society apart. It creates a gigantic class called the proletariat, which is dispossessed workers who don't own capital. And our only real interest as the proletariat, I mean... You get some people trying to recreate middle classes as their strategy. That's not really a lasting strategy. Because you're just going to wind up at this place again eventually. Uh, our interest becomes in abolishing private property, you know, moving towards socialism, basically. So you have China on the one hand, minding its own business and actually trying to encourage development. You know, the thing that the U.S. is always saying it's doing internationally, but doesn't do, and just leaves like a trail of destruction and war behind it and tries to dominate countries economically with debt traps and all that stuff, well, China's not doing that. And, of course, that's a threat to the U.S. You know, they've posted clips of this on CGTN, Chinese network. I recommend following it. It's, you know, not everything's gold, but it can provide some really interesting non-U.S.-based perspectives for sure. But basically, uh, there was a clip on there they showed of some, you know, Washington think tank types speaking at a conference and saying, we don't want any peers, we don't want any competitors, this is the U.S. now, saying that they will try to take down China even if the, you know, global working poor suffer as a result. They don't care about the public good. They just don't want peers and competitors. So basically the U.S., Empire is in decline. Capitalism is just burning itself out and relying more and more on naked military force to stay afloat. And they just do not want any existing examples of somebody doing it better, fairer, more cooperatively. They don't, and it doesn't have to be perfect to meet those criteria. They just don't want anybody doing it better because it makes them look bad by comparison. And guess what? The worse that the U.S., actually looks, i.e. the worse that the U.S.'s situation gets, the more that they are threatened by basically every other country in the world who has got it even remotely together. So that's what we can expect from the U.S. in the next 20 years if the U.S. lasts that long, is more lashing out and more trying to weaponize whatever allies are foolish enough to go along with this dying empire. But I think that the uh, most telling thing comes near the end of this article. So it says that although the submarines are currently not carrying nuclear weapons, well, I'll read a quote. 
the United States has explored moving away from highly enriched uranium, etc., etc., but China's aggressive tactics in the Pacific and America's desire to ensure security for Taiwan, because the U.S. just cares so fucking much about Taiwan. You know, the U.S., again, I, I don't even know that I need to comment on this. The U.S. obviously doesn't fucking care about anything but corporate profits. They want to get their hands on more resources and more cheap or free labor. That's all the U.S. cares about. Period. This human rights... I don't know how people even buy into that for a microsecond. I, it, it requires being completely ignorant of U.S. history. Completely. But I guess, you know, thank you, U.S. education system, because that is what it produces in, in many cases. Anyway, required the U.S. to empower Australia even if it meant carving an exception to the effort to reduce the use of weapons-grade nuclear fuel, according to Elbridge Colby, former Deputy Assistant, Secretary of Defense, Strategy and Force Development. Quote, if non-proliferation has to take a back seat in order to stop China, that's the right call, said Mr. Colby. And again, you know, when I say stop China, I mean stop China from just being, you know, peacefully prosperous. <laughs> that's, that's what they're trying to stop. Again, they don't want any peers showing them up. That's literally it. So here you have people talking about, we're going to give Australia, you know, powerful submarines to start trying to hem in and threaten China. That is only going to escalate the risk of military conflict and who is driving it. The U S UK, Canada, Australia, that's who. So this is what you're trying to take over, social democrats. Do you think you can do that? You think you can take over this organization, the Democratic Party, which is sharing Republican talking points like, you know, oh yeah, we may need to uh, have exceptions to, you know, nuclear disarmament, you know, and they'll just justify it because China, and then they'll feed you on Rose Twitter some CIA State Department bullshit that you'll parrot uncritically. I mean, people really need to get better about that. I know, like, you're in this because you want health care or whatever. Um, there's a lot of Republicans who want health care, too. The distinction of you're on the, quote, left, you got to, like, do a little bit better than you want health care. You've got to actually look into the history of imperialism and get a lot better about not believing the bullshit that the United States military is spoon feeding you. We just simply don't have time for this garbage anymore. Okay, you need to catch yourselves up. Fortunately, there are channels like Socialism for All. We do audiobooks all day, every day. And the sole purpose is to educate and agitate you in the correct direction. This is why theory is important, so you don't wind up parroting U.S. State Department talking points and supporting the very empire that is denying you all the things that you want let alone all the other people around the world who have even less and want more things because the military is in there paving the way for that country to be oppressed and to have all their surplus value skimmed off and sent up here to this country where you benefit directly or indirectly from that. So time to widen the picture with an internationalist socialist outlook. That is your task. The materials are there. You just need to access them, okay? I've even read them to you, and I've even helped you with little notes here and there to break them down and digest them and understand them. It's now on you. You've got to, you know, I can spark you. You've got to do the work, though, and build the movements because ultimately that's what needs to happen to take power. So anyway, coming off of the Biden article, there is a third piece to this. Looking at that hypocrisy around the nuclear non-proliferation, it reminded me, I was like, wait a minute, wasn't there some hubbub a few years ago because Trump was pulling the U.S. out of treaties like this? And indeed, here's an article, here are all the treaties and agreements Trump has abandoned. This is from 2019, and it's from CNN, and it goes on, President Donald Trump's decision to begin the process of withdrawing the United States from the intermediate range Nuclear Forces Treaty will end an arms control agreement with Russia 
that has been a centerpiece of European security since the Cold War. So, this was a problem when Trump did it, or at least it was framed as that. But really, you have Biden doing the same thing. So you see, there are people behind both parties, the capitalist class in general, they own both parties. There is a consensus here that they divide up the tasks, okay? There's a certain division of labor. The Republicans play bad cop. This is, you may be familiar with the ratchet effect, okay? The Republicans play bad cop. They do all the bad shit. They come in, they scream in your face, they rough you up, they throw you up against the wall, they, you know, knock your stuff on the floor, they try to scare the hell out of you and brutalize you. Then the Democrats come in and they play good cop. They try to calm you down, they give you a glass of water, they ask you if you want a candy bar. But both of them are there for the same purpose. And I mentioned the ratchet effect. This is where the Republicans take things to the right, and then the Democrats come in to block movement to the left. They basically keep what the Republicans have done, help to cement it, then the Republicans get back in, they move it another notch to the right, and then the Democrats come in afterwards, and they prevent things from going back to the left. So all you get is this click, click, click over to the right, and the Democrats are there as a doorstop, to prevent any reverse motion back to the left. And this has been going on for a long time. The idea, I mean, and this is well-coordinated. They've been strategizing about this for decades. The idea that you're going to step into the Democratic Party and it's going to somehow be different this time. It's been done over and over again. You know, whether it's Wellstone or Kucinich or whoever it is, there's always some like liberal martyr, you know, from the left wing of the Democratic Party who gets up and this is, you know, since the 1980s when they really started cracking down on the liberal wing. It was neoliberalism, the conservative counter revolution or the conservative answer to the New Deal. They're like, no, we're going to repeal everything. We're going to privatize, defund, deregulate. Okay, well, the left wing of the Democratic Party was one of the first things to go. Since then, you get a few vestiges of that type of politics standing up and saying, hey, what about this? And like I said, you get one of two outcomes there. You either get shredded and tossed aside your life ruined after doing one good thing, you know, one regulation that you pass, and then they absolutely destroy you for doing it, or you just get assimilated. You know, AOC is kind of doing the latter. You know, she still tweets a good game here and there, although, for my money, her tweets are increasingly just incomprehensible collections of buzzwords that just don't even make any sense at all. Uh, But, you know, the basic center of gravity there is in the Pelosi wing of the Democratic Party, and AOC is now dangling you know, a, just as an appendage of that, you know, but Bernie Sanders, he's more of that previous type that I mentioned, the, you know, Wellstone or Kucinich that stands up and says, we're going to bring this party back to its, you know, more left liberal New Deal roots. Well, it never works. The only reason that I granted Bernie Sanders some kind of slack or, you know, I was willing to entertain the notion because he was coming from outside the Democratic Party. But we have now seen, you know, the proofs in the pudding. We watched in 2015, 2016, and in 2019, 2020, that, that it's just even he couldn't or wouldn't do it. Uh, but you think it's going to be different for you. No, it isn't. What we need is to build an independent left and then to protect it from getting co-opted by the Democratic Party which is one of the things they live for. They live to co-opt and pick off socialists who are independent. They will tell you all kinds of things. Oh, you can't win without us, blah, 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 blah. But the minute you join them, you're neutralized. You're done. Like it, it, That's why people have been calling it a graveyard of social movements for decades. And it's not going to be different this time. You know, back in the 1930s, They passed the New Deal, the FDR wing of the Democratic Party, the faction, the FDR faction. He was a rich guy. 
But for whatever reason, his faction uh, accumulated a number of reformers and progressives and whatever, and they did pass some landmark social democratic reforms. However, what was the context there? The context was Russian Revolution, 1917, up through the Civil War to 1922, also the Coal Wars in the United States. This was the biggest armed conflict in the United States since the Civil War in the 1920s, going on in the East Coast, Appalachian Mountains. People were getting into a shooting war over the way that the coal barons were you know, usurping land and people uh, into their coal mines. There was serious strife in the country, and even that, I mean, for like a brief vanishing moment, FDR was in there for a few terms, got this stuff done, but as soon as he did, the Democratic Party started walking back from that. They had economic, class-based politics for like a decade, and then immediately reverted to an individual rights sort of liberalism which they've been doing ever since. They participated in anti-communist witch hunts. McCarthyism was only a problem for the Democrats when Democrats started getting caught up in it. They didn't really mind McCarthyism taking out the communists and socialists. They're an anti-communist party, fundamentally. You had this brief infiltration by the labor movement. How did the Democrats thank the labor movement? Well, the labor movement peaked in 1960 and has been on the decline ever since. And they keep talking about, for example, card check, which would be a really simple way to make union elections a lot easier and a lot harder for employers to meddle with. And we'd probably see a lot more unions being created. What have the Democrats done? They've been talking about it for a long time. They won't do it. But you think it's going to be different for you. It's not. So you have, for example, this sort of consensus that it's back on the table for the U.S. maybe to get back into nuclear weapons again. And that's coming from, you know, when Trump does it, it's like, oh, that nasty Trump. He's uh, violating these longstanding treaties. And then with the quote, left hand, the capitalists put on the Democratic Party puppet, and they're like, oh, well, you know, I mean, that was bad and all, but since the treaty's gone, um, why don't we take advantage of this for the China problem? And, of course, it is one puppeteer of both parties. It's the 1%. It's the capitalist class. They're a lot stronger than we are. And you think that latching on to that sock puppet on the one percent's left hand you think that that is a strategy social democrats it isn't on this channel we teach marxism and marxism leninism and associated movements which have cropped up after marxism leninism and have further developed and applied those concepts and theories to newly emerging situations as imperialism has spread worldwide. And we've seen people fight their way out of oppression. We've seen people fight their way out of poverty using Marxist techniques. And that works in a decent amount of cases. What doesn't work is trying to get into a bourgeois party and begging and pleading with them to move left for a month before they just grab you by the hair and drag you right. So it's time to give it up. You've got in the Democrats a party which is pretty committed to right-wing policies and in the Republican Party you have a party which is now centered in the white nationalist MAGA wing. And these are the two main tools that the capitalist class are using in their political arena that they use to manage their system, capitalism. It's not your system, social democrats, it's theirs. Working people, this isn't a system for us. If you want a system for us, you have to get rid of the existing system and then you have to institute a new system. I have 
pinned on my Twitter for Socialism for All and pinned on the YouTube channel, Lenin's The State and Revolution. If you want to actually learn this, I would suggest starting there. There are other things that can teach you, you know, more of the basics of Marxism and the economic theories. But I find that the state and revolution answers probably, it, it just goes to the heart of the questions that people have about Marxist theory of revolution and initiating socialism, kicking out the capitalists and starting the process of building socialism and how to do that. Again, this has worked. What hasn't worked is this thing you're trying to do. The Democratic Party is our enemy. It's literally set up as a catch basin for left movements. It exists to co-opt and pick us off. It's been doing that very effectively. And then you never hear from those people again. Do you want to end up like that? If you don't, accept reality. You've got to go further left than maybe you're comfortable with right now. But it has to be done. And I'm going to leave you with that thought for right now. Do check out State and Revolution. Start there. If uh, you're listening in the comments and you think that there's another good starting point, you know, don't overwhelm new listeners, but if you think that there's one magic bullet, you know, another like really good, I read this one thing and it changed my whole outlook kind of book, go ahead and suggest that. If you have any other comments, as usual, let's continue the discussion. So thanks for listening. Thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. You can sign up for as little as $2 a month. All of those donations are very encouraging. I appreciate them a lot. They're also materially helpful, so thank you. If you'd like to help out without making a donation, liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting are all good ways to do that, particularly on Facebook. Uh, S4A has no Facebook presence currently. If you can share some into the left-wing groups, the few that remain there, that's a good way to spread the word. Just be careful. Facebook hates S4A. Don't get banned in the process. S4A got kicked off three times. But whatever it is that you do online and in your community to agitate, educate, and organize against capital and for socialism, thanks for doing it. Keep it up, and we will catch you in the next video.